Okay. I thought I'd take you for a little ride. This is the Indian Territory. There's a tribe of Indians that live in these woods. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my biking history. In 1956, I was happy as a pig in mud. I was going to military school. I was attending Lyman Ward Military Academy. Today it's a prestigious college, or actually a prestigious uh, academy. But back in, back in the 50s when I attended, it was basically, that's where families put their kids in reform school if they, they didn't behave. Uh, it was a private school, and uh, they had full control over your existence. Well, unfortunately, in May of 1956, I got a call that my brother was killed in the army and I was to proceed to California. Well, I arrived in Los Angeles in May of 1956 and the family come down, my, my mom was living out there and they come down and pick me up and my brother's body was shipped from Fort Story, Virginia over to Barstow, California. That's where he took his tank training. And uh, so anyhow, we had the, the, the dreadful funeral. It was a military funeral, but it was hard on everybody. We got through it. And we, we, we were all basically trying to pull it together. My, mo my mom was pretty distraught. So there was a young man that came to the funeral. He had been in the Army. And uh, he worked out at the Borax Mines in the Mojave Desert in a town called Boron, California. Boron. That's where we was living. That's where my mom was living. So uh, we uh, got acquainted. He had a Harley. It was a one-year-old Harley. He bought it in 1955. And I think it had like a 72 inch engine on it. It didn't have a big motor. Not like a Sportster. I think it it might have been, a, I don't know, it might have been a Sportster. 1955 model. So, uh, he took me for a ride out in the desert. Oh man, I was in love with that. And after we rode a few times with him, he said, would you like to learn? how to ride the motorcycle. I said, well, hell yes. I might have said it with a little bit more vigor than that. I was pretty excited. So he showed me how to run it through the gears. He showed me how to start it. In those days, you had to start it with a pedal on the side, Kickstarter. And so, uh, He said, now you're ready for your lesson. He took me way out by this, uh, kind of like a mountain out in the desert. You can look 
off across the desert and see the borax mines. So we uh, were way out in the outback wilderness, sand, and he told me he wanted me to ride the bike, through, run it through the gears, go up about a quarter of a mile, turn around, come back down, and gear down so when I came back up to him, I would come to a full stop and put it in neutral. And that would be my lesson. Well, I did. I run it through the gears, got up there, downshifted when I got up to the quarter mile mark. And I commenced making my turn there in the desert. Unfortunately, I was going a little fast. And there was a lever over on the right handlebar. To slow it down, I just grabbed that lever right over there. Well, now all you bikers know that's a big no-no. Of course, the bike went down immediately. And so I, um, I weighed 100 pounds soaking wet, 110 pounds. <laughs> you know, I didn't have, didn't have much meat on my bones. I was a, I was in really, a really excellent shape because um, I'd been training down at the military academy and, and did a little boxing and I was in physical shape. So I lifted the bike up off the ground, got it on the kickstand, kicked the motor over it, started. And I rode back to him and stopped and had it neutral. And he said, you learned a lesson, didn't you? I can't see her. Well, look at this little hand right here. <laughs> oh, this little hand. She's a. Uh, she's all ready to go for some serious ride. She's letting go. She really like this ride. Uh, I said, "What was my lesson?" He said, "You learned about putting the brakes on in the sand." And I said, "Yes, I did." And that was a lifetime lesson. I didn't have to be taught again. And uh, I have been riding now for 68 years. Let me tell you, uh, we had a lot of bikes over the years. I shared with uh, some of my fellow Alabama riders about some of the adventures we had in the young years, early years. I uh, had Triumphs, Yamahas, Hondas, Suzuki. Uh, I had them all. I mean, I had to try them all out. I had crotch rockets. Super bikes, and uh, I uh, I love I loved them all. I stopped at my brother-in-law's house in uh, Moses Lake, Washington. The boy was recovering from uh, back injury, and he'd been building a bike. He built a, uh, a fueler bike that run on fuel. And he asked me if I'd test ride it for him. And I said, sure. So I took it on a test ride. And it was awesome. I think that back in the day, his fuel was like five or six dollars a gallon. And gasoline was 19 cents a gallon. What a difference between gasoline and when you run fuel, methanol. So anyhow, I uh, I love that bike. Uh, we had a chopper in the 
60s, my brother and I went to a chopper shop in uh, Kennewick, Washington, and we cut a deal, my brother did, you know, he wanted this chopper built, he wanted it to look like the Easy Rider chopper, a small gas tank, twice pipes up the side with fish tips, all that stuff, and I loved it. Well, he bought it. Next thing I know, he's got a little baby on the way. And in our days, back in the early days, my brother and I, we was always had a little baby on the way. And my sisters, they had little babies on the way all the time, too. So, um, I ended up getting the, the bike. And I was in between women, and I had myself a big woman. Big gal. She used to sit on that little pad on the back fender back there, on that chopper. One time we was running down the road about 70. I saw a sign that said, dip ahead. Well, I didn't, I didn't think about it being a big dip. I figured it'd be just a dip. Well, it turned out to be a big dip. We go in into the dip. We were on Washington State Highway 17. We uh, got down into the bottom of the dip. All that Springer front end, it was completely loaded, pushed back up. And of course, as we started coming up out of this uh, deep depression, the front Springer started to unload. And the front end, as we come up the other side. Now, as I told you in the beginning, the girl riding on the back was a big girl. She had what you call today the kids would be referred to her, her having a lot of junk in the trunk. She was a chunky monkey. Chunky monkey. I loved all the women. I, didn't, I loved them thick and thin. Everything. Anyhow, we came out the other side. The front end went straight up in the air. Her butt cheeks were dragging the pavement. <laughs> uh, no, not exactly, but we were we stood it straight up, come up out of that hole. Now you know when you lift a springer up off the ground, a lot of you guys have done wheelies on springers. Uh, they when they come down, they get a thing called golly wobble. When I touch down. I guess my front wheel wasn't exactly straight. And uh, I went into this golly wobble, shaking the bike all over. But uh, we uh, we managed to get it under control. And uh, anyhow, she was hanging, up, hanging on for dear life back there. I love that old chopper. We, one time, my brother-in-law, which I love dearly, my brother-in-law, Ray, came up to me. We were out in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley in California, just over by Fresno, Madeira. And we was looking at the Sierra Nevadas. It was 106 degrees. I was driving a Caterpillar tractor. My brother was driving a Caterpillar tractor. And he come riding up in a service truck and he said, I'd sure like to go up there and put my feet in that snow. And I said to him, hell, let's go. So my brother Robert, he was always ready. My brother Robert, I don't care what I planned up, you could always count on him. He was a guy, he was a man's man. He's a righteous man today. He said, let's go. So we was wearing Levi jackets back in the day. And so we strapped our Levi jacket on the sissy bar on our bike. All three of our bikes had sissy bars on them. So, we t 
take off from Merced, close to Chachilla, and we went up to Yosemite Park. We rode all the way up into the Yosemite Valley, got up there at sunset. When we got up there, it was 50 degrees and freezing. We had a little bed roll, so uh, hey, we got us something fixed up to eat there in the campfire. Rolled our beds out, old sleeping bag, and crawled into the sleeping bag there. We was wore out. That's a long ride from Madeira up to Yosemite Park. So uh, we're laying all up in there in the, in the sleeping land when we begin to hear a lot of screaming and yelling and yelling, uh, yell, uh, yeller, <laughs> yelling. So it got our curiosity. And when, and when uh, we began to look around inside the park, people were running everywhere. And they were saying there's three bears in the camp. Now, me and old Robert and Ray used to ride with a bunch of motorcycle guys called the Bar Hoppers. We'd go from one bar to another and drink, and we wasn't afraid of nothing. Back in the day, we didn't have no fear of anything. So, we grabbed garbage can lids and started hurting the bears out of the park with the garbage can lid. You just keep beating them together. Well, when the bears started running, they run through a tent that had two human beings inside the tent. And one of the bears got tangled up in the tent and he shredded that tent. I'm talking about when he, when he came out of there, there was parts of tent flying everywhere and then I saw two people running in different directions, screaming. <laughs> so the bears run on. All that bear wanted to do was get out of that tent. So, uh, we run the bears off. Okay, uh, let, let me back up just a little bit. Uh, when we, uh, went over to where the two people were sleeping in the tent and they come running up to us. They were so happy that they, they wasn't eaten alive. <laughs> so um, I uh, talked to them a little bit and all of a sudden here these people come up and they wanted to know what the hell was all that noise about. While we was out there beating them, uh, them garbage can lids, then that young lady, she told one of these old fussy guys, she said, these people just saved our lives. She said, we was in the tent, and when the, when the bear run through the tent, got inside the tent with us, and he couldn't get out, he started clawing his way out of the tent. Had they not kept beating their garbage can lids together, they may have decided to start eating on us. Yeah, we had a lot of a lot of good times on a motorcycle. And uh, Motorcycle has been a way of life. I, I bought a really nice Suzuki. I thought I was, uh, I, I had made it. I bought it like a street bike Suzuki when I lived in uh, Seattle. And I, I only lived about three miles from my workstation. So when I'd come home, I would park the Suzuki on the front porch. It was a concrete porch. Well, I, I got
get up there and uh, it was like early Saturday morning. Let me tell you, when I opened that door, there was no motorcycle on the front porch. Of course I called the police and they said they would put it on the list of stolen bikes but not to hold my breath. And we never saw that bike again. But I bought another. When I got down to uh, down to Missouri one of the crunch rockets I bought was a 750 model in Suzuki and it had I put on it as soon as I bought it it was brand new I put four in the one Kirker exhaust golly I think it turned 10,500 RPM it was a sweet machine I used to ride my motorcycle on Road. When I was working with the missile crew, we had a special road. We hauled the missiles out to the silo, and the law was not allowed to be on the road. You had to have clearance, and we had no posted speed limit because if you had a leak, if you had a situation where you had a truck turned over. These transport erectors are 105 foot long. Let's say for some reason they crashed. You'd have to uh, like you'd have to try to get away from the site, you know, from the wherever the crash site was because the radiation would kill you. We had cars, they would give us when we were um, Maelstrom Air Force Base, they gave us uh, American Ambassador cars. They were called, they had police interceptor engines, 405 cubit inch or 401 cubit inch. But these things had the police package on them and they would run. I've had mine over 130 more than once on the TE road. Those things were fast. Then when we got down to Missouri, the GSA didn't have near as much budget. We was on at that time, Minuteman 3, um, we were doing a uh, the last installment of the Minuteman 3. So we didn't have near as much budget down in Missouri. So they gave us American Motor Hornets. They had that big thunderous six-cylinder motor in it. And we run them things so hard. We called them, uh, you guys that live here in America, you might remember there's a period of time when the fruit was being uh, affected by a book called the Midfly. And they ended up spraying chemicals on the midfly to kill the to kill the uh, midfly, but it had paraquat in it, and it was poison when you eat the fruit. People were getting really, really sick. So uh, we uh, started calling our American Motor Hornet. See. On the Hornet on the hood, out there on the hood, you had a little emblem, a little plastic emblem, and inside there was a, a little Hornet. Well, we call it the Midfly. <laughs> yeah, the Midfly. We, uh, we rode around the Lake of the Ozarks when it was just being filled up. We left Appleton City about 12 or 15 of us and we took a ride all the way around the Lake of the Ozarks 
That's a three day journey. And that whole crew, all the guys that I was riding with, they're all engineers and you know, city boys. They never they never had a hard line. But we had one Harley guy. He was riding a fat bob. <laughs> now he was he was Harley to the bone. You can always count and depend on him. Them city boys there. Uh, they uh, they wasn't too rugged. But we got down at the very bottom of the Lake of the Ozark. And this gentleman on the Harley, on his fat bob, he was the leader of the pack. Like that son, the leader of the pack. We come up over a rise, and at the very top of the hill was a Chevron gas station. And a little grandma old lady in a Chevrolet Nova pulled out in front of the Fat Bob. The Fat Bob hits her at the door and bounced the Fat Bob back. It hit and bounced, you know, the suspension and the rubber tire. Fat Bob's got a big tire on it. It dented her door in, but it bounced him back here and we all got stopped. And of course the law came out there and they wanted to make a big deal because there was like 30 bikers in their town. City boy bikers and a couple of Harley riders. Anyhow, we got it all sorted out. What a fun, uh, what a fun ride that was. One time, we went to a NASCAR race in Kansas City, and the race didn't get over until one o'clock in the morning. The time that we got out of the grandstand, got down to our our bikes, and uh, my uh, my neighbor, he was an airman. We were stationed at Whiteman Air Force Base. My neighbor bought, he bought my, uh, I had a Honda, four-cylinder Honda that was a crotch rocket. It was, I'm talking about the best and the fastest Honda I had at that time. And we, uh, uh, we're coming back from the race, and we got on uh, on one of the U.S. highways that goes to Sedalia, Missouri. Even though I was living on the base, and he was too, at Nobnoster, the road we had to take was heading towards Sedalia, Missouri. And here it is at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. They ain't any, all the farmers are asleep. Everybody laying up there, you know. So uh, we decided to find out which crotch rocket was the fastest, my N-Series Suzuki or my old Honda that I used to have, which was built to the hilt now. I'm talking about that Honda. I spent a lot of money after I bought it making the thing run, making it fast. Well, we were zipping along there on that U.S. highway and I was slightly ahead of him at well over 100 miles per hour 110, 120 you know you don't really pay a lot of attention to the speedometer at that speed in the dark of the night you're basically you got your eyes all dilated trying to see where are you going well, I saw this huge porcupine. I'm talking about a porcupine bigger than anything I've ever seen in the Northwest on that U.S. highway. That was a four-lane highway, and we're heading east on this four-lane
lane highway and the thing walked past me. Now I know he's over there in that left lane cooking along above 100. But I didn't see him go down. The light stayed on and we made it up to Nod Noster. We went over and we stopped. We lived side by side. We parked the bikes. And he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, did you see that animal on the road? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, that was a porcupine. He said, oh my God, the thing just, just as I was about to hit him, he turned. And me and him, me and this, my buddy, that porcupine right between the middle of us. And we're riding pretty close together. We didn't hit the porcupine. But um, once again, everybody out there that's hearing my story knows that they have the same kind of stories. Theirs might vary a little bit different, but they're gonna they're gonna have their stories. Young people that just coming up. I mean, I ain't saying take a risk or nothing like that, but go out and find your limit. Find out where the limit is. I've been to I've been to the limit. I've been to the limit and crossed that barrier and came back. That's not a place I want to see a young rider go to, but. Find out where your limit is. The bike's going to show you that limit pretty quick. Just don't kill yourself. I don't want to. Don't want to lose you. But have some fun on that trip down to around the Lake of the Ozarks. I bought a six-pack of beer. On, on my Honda, before we hot rodded it, I, I had a Vetter, Vetter fairing. And over here on the right hand side, there was a big compartment here. And I filled it full of ice and put six cans of beer in that ice. So now I'm coming up on this nice road. I'm thirsty. And I say to myself, it's time to have a cold beer. So I reach over and unsnap the compartment and got me, well I, first of all I was shocked when I saw the cans, those six cans of beer had spun round and round and round inside of the, uh, the compartment and there was no, no paint on the can. They were slick, they was polished, they'd spun in that ice to rub all the paint off the cans. Now that should have been a clue right there, there might be going to be something wrong there. When I pull that tab on the top of that can, I kid you not, I left a quarter mile contrail behind me. That can literally emptied itself. When I, when I popped that top, I realized it started to spray on me, so I put the, the can out in the wind stream. And my God, there was not a drop of beer left in that can. <laughs> so when we got to a little roadside park, everybody wanted to stop. And I told them, I said, boys, there's five cans of beer right there. Ice cold. Well, some of the boys are smarter than the others. Instead of popping the top, they turned the beer sideways. They turned it sideways. Tucked their knife and poked a hole in the side of the can. And it started coming out like Old Faithful. They put their lips over that, that spray. And they sucked that can of beer down. I'm talking about it, it was like fuel injected. They had beer coming out of their nose. Well, I 
I'm hoping you've enjoyed this little ride along here in Alabama. I'm nearing the little town of Wynn. You want to look it up on the map. This is uh, Wynn, Alabama. Coming up on it. We just came out of the Bankhead Forest. All you boys in Alabama, you know where I'm at. US. I'm on Highway 33. It's a uh, wonderful ride through the forest. You saw all the logging trucks. These are big timber. These are not your little timber. I mean, there's some tall trees in here. We have a lot of deciduous trees, oaks, hickory nut. And uh, the deciduous uh, makes some of the best furniture in the world. And uh, anyhow, uh, I'm sure y'all are going to let me know <laughs> if you like this journey or not. But Fourth of July is here. And everybody's partying, getting ready to party. They're going to be all night fireworks. Uh, they'll be shooting stuff. It ain't, it ain't the fourth yet, but it's approaching the fourth. And there are going to be a lot of fireworks. And uh, it'll be fun to listen to. My neighbors, I got some really good neighbors. They will be shooting stuff tonight and tomorrow night. And then they'll get serious. <laughs> On the 4th now, they're going to be going nuts. Now, out there where we live, they shoot a lot of dynamite because everybody's got a little dynamite. Farm people, you know, farmers blow up stumps. Getting dynamite in Alabama is kind of like buying toilet paper in Sydney. You know, it's easy to do. Our toilet paper in Alabama, we call it the John Wayne toilet paper. They got it on sale up there at Walmart, the John Wayne toilet paper. The reason they call it the John Wayne toilet paper because it's rough and it don't, it don't take crap off nobody. But it's only 19 cents a roll. Get you a John Wayne toilet paper while it's still in stock. Tried to keep this video under an hour, and that's hard to do. I could break it up in little segments, but hey, if you have the time to watch the thing, watch a few minutes, go take you a nap, go pet your dog. Go play with the kids. Find something to entertain yourself. And then uh, come back and watch another four or five minute segment. Because it'll be here when you come back. Alabama Pumpwood. Up in Washington State, those long, tall, skinny pine trees. Up there, they refer to those tall, skinny pine trees as pecker poles. Well, I guess it's because there's a lot of woodpeckers on it, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll stick with that story. Well, you see my uh, my LED lights lit up that sign in the, in the brightness of the day. And if anybody says they don't see these LEDs out front there, well, uh, that means they're blind. close to wind. I don't have my GPS hooked up here, but I know we're running out of the forest. Getting back down into the lowlands. Bikers like this road here. It's a it's a good good little road for uh, you know straighten your stuff. If you like to drag the pegs, you can do it. Them things are over for me. 
I got a little woman back there on the back of that bike. I'd do anything in the world to keep her from being hurt. 